Previously on Is This Thing On, the students were given the task of delivering new material all about themselves, and a gap started to emerge between the capable... Which is crazy, because Jetstar just had a two-for-one sale last week. <laughs> ...and less capable comedians. I've lost my train of thought. Kim DeCruz had a minor meltdown. Oh, can we, can I have a second? While We're Brad together. found new confidence thanks to some sage advice from Steve Van Appren. Oh, I'm incredibly funny. I've got yes, lots of funny things to say. Guest comedian Mayumi Nabetsu spoke about seeing the audience as one giant organism, then took the students to a life drawing class where she encouraged everyone to get nude. <laughs> It's now day three, and Glyn is keen to hear what the class made of yesterday's bizarre excursion. Ah! Right, Steve Davis, just tell us in a quick summary, tell, tell me what happened yesterday. Uh, it was like going to the doctors, but a little more invasive. <laughs> okay. uh, we had to be nude in an art studio yeah. and paint a man who was nude. And unfortunately, I sat at the front, so people were looking at me from behind. Well, I think he's well, unfortunate the... for all of us. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. being in the back, we got to yes. see it every art. By the way, I was standing in front of uh, Kim. <laughs> oh, yeah, you were. <laughs> so, Steve Mackey, how did you feel painting while you were painting this? Yeah, I was pretty uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> one to be over with. I didn't know where to look. <laughs> I was looking over the, everywhere apart from the <laughs> model. It was probably a bit confronting. I mean, it was nice looking at that young, you know, naked guy. But I don't know how many <laughs> of us really felt that we measured up to that. You know, I guess we all have different types of comedy. We all have different body shapes. We all have different views of the world. So I think that kind of came out. And um, but at the end of the day, when you strip everything back, we're all kind of the same. So yeah. and you lose that kind of um, self-consciousness. My style is not too explicit. It's much more suggestive, like giving an idea of the form without necessarily explaining it and hopefully, you know, getting some humour into some of those life experiences. So you've got a sense of what it looks like without being too specific. And that sort of came out in, in, in what I created in that, uh, in that drawing class. OK, whose is this? Mine. OK, what's this? So I did a dedication to her. To so Mayumi? Yeah, I did it from the perspective of him, I guess. I don't know, I just thought I'd throw the mum thing in there. Ah, uh, OK. <laughs> Maybe it was a message from my mum at home, I'm not sure. Ironically, I remember when I told my mum I was going to come and do this and my mum said, just don't make an ass of yourself. <laughs> Someone told me earlier that there was a sense of, of almost bonding between you all. When we're confronted, uh, when we're fearful, and this would be a very confronting in, in a funny, fearful way. We do cling to things that unite us can often be a common enemy. And you'll probably find that because you're closer to one another, it could be more that you'll be able to help each other. Who is this? Judy's. My Judy. incredible work of art. I've been yes. discovered. I'm You've expecting been? a call from the National Gallery in a minute. <laughs> OK. Uh, how did you feel? Uh, uncomfortable. But after the initial... <laughs> It's amazing how quickly you get comfortable with the situation. I was very adamant, no, I'm not going to do this and, you know, whatever, but really when I actually was confronted with the idea, I thought, oh, actually, what's the big deal? He had a good ass, I have to admit. He, I think we all agree that he was... This guy was very tidy. As, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I seriously, I'd turn gay for him in a heartbeat. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a hot blooded male and you just you just turn around and look and you just, you just can't help yourself. But, Dropping the gaze, you know, you just sneak a peek at anyone, you know, any male, female. It's just like, I mean, we're all doing it. Who is this? It's me. me. Well, you know, interesting, isn't it? Sometimes when we create art, it is often a reflection a little bit about us. So you've chosen to go the whole body. Any reason for that? The guy kind of looked like me. I was like, half tempted to walk on stage and stand next to the guy and be like, <laughs> and oh my comparison. God, I'm seeing double. Oh. <laughs> oh, that wasn't you on the stage yesterday? <laughs> no, it wasn't me because um, that guy had a, a fantastic body and you were like, oh, I thought you said you worked out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was pretty Sorry. comfortable by the end of it because um, everyone was painting my butt at the end. <laughs> you got your, paint, your butt painted, really? Yes, yeah, That's interesting. It's very revealing. <laughs> well, I'd be interested to get Steve's thoughts on that later. Um, <laughs> this is this. I, I just repeatedly tried to contour his ass cheeks. Oh, so you gave him a And it just, you know, I said, no, nah, that's not good enough. And I tried again and I tried again and it just kind of ended up like he's wearing a cheese string. So... <laughs> it, does, it does look a bit like that. I'm not really 
an artist per se. Like I, I never get into it, but I've recognised it as a part of me that I've wanted to develop. And I had a chat with the lady who was doing the art and she said, look, you know, work out what you like and then try and do it. And as soon as you try and do it, you'll see what goes into it and you can appreciate it when you see it. And it's like, wow, so simple. I went way too deep with my painting. Everyone was externalising the ass. Yes. <laughs> so I painted an internal ass. So what does this represent? That's the asshole. <laughs> oh, that's the asshole. okay. Yes. Yeah, and that's the mess around it. That's the mess around it. What's this? That's paper. <laughs> okay. What's the okay. mess okay. around the body? Yeah. And, and what does this say? It says exit only, which is a common saying that people say about their ass. It's abstract. You just squeeze yes, it and maybe is. So turn your head slightly to like the left. Oh, yeah. yeah. Step back a little bit. <laughs> You're focusing on the functionality as yeah, well as I'm the appearance. I'm a functioning mess. That's essentially what I. Wrote. That's what that's saying. It's yeah, I don't waste anything, yeah. and I'm a messy asshole. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> We have to need to talk to you about self-esteem. What's this one? See, him being naked didn't bother me. Everyone else being naked didn't bother me. I am a nurse, so I've seen a lot of naked people. It doesn't even phase me anymore. Um, it was just me being naked was the issue. Unlike everyone else, I was trying to be earnest uh, during this exercise so that I had tunnel vision and wasn't seeing what was around me. The good student down the front, wishing I'd been at the back. <laughs> you know how couples who've been together finish each other's sentences and anticipate things more. I wonder if we're going to have a lot more intuitive awareness of what everyone else in the group is thinking or wanting to do. I just solely had my eyes um, focused on what I envisioned my second husband to look like. All right. <laughs> with a great and bottom. With a great bottom, very, very important. I just let go. I just kind of just didn't even think about it. I just focused on what the challenge was. Became in the moment rather than thinking about, you know, what everyone else thinks of you. So you're all feeling now, after this experience, you've expressed yourself artistically. You've bared yourselves as much as anyone can. And as a result, feeling better? I think as people we just always want to belong to something and I haven't belonged to much actually for quite some time and now yeah. I look to you guys and we all belong to each other. <laughs> you, you do and you know the other thing is you're learning how to get a group of people however many it is also to belong. It's a moment in time where people share a moment in time which is so fantastic about what you're doing. The life drawing exercise with Mayumi had galvanised the group and provided a level of confidence that would prove pivotal in delivering a stand-up comedy performance in just three days' time. With the class now more cohesive, Glyn felt it was time to drill down deeper into their material and start being ruthless about what was funny and what was just a sentence. Some of the gags, I think we need more set up. Yes, absolutely. So, har harass used to be two words. For example, you need to find a way we're absolutely going to get it, so you'll give two other examples, or you'll say harass, harass, her ass. I love that her, harass bit. Oh, I wasn't sure. But I would slow it down, because I think I know it. Yeah. I just move on quickly, but what I was doing is I'm sitting there and I'm thinking about it, I'm like, is that what she means? And then I've lost your next joke. Meanwhile, behavioural analyst Steve Van Apron had a plan to help Steve Mackey and Judy Stoltz with their confidence levels on stage. I'm going to be you. How do you think you've been performing? Uh, Tasks that I'm going to set for you two now. We are going to go outside, we're going to go down to the jam factory, and we're going to get a group of people that you've never met, and we're going to get them both to busk in front of them. All right, sounds good. Cool. Sweet. Oh, I'm uh, <laughs> the best way to confront a fear is to confront it head on, because once you do that, once you make the first step, the rest is easy. So let's go. All right, let's, let me get your jacket. Judy's cavalier attitude was a continuation of her willingness to strip naked in yesterday's life drawing class. She clearly made a decision that she was fully committed to doing whatever it took to make sure she got laughs on Saturday night. For Steve Mackey, the thought of gathering a group of complete strangers in the middle of a busy street and forcing them to watch him perform was nothing short of terrifying. OK, let's talk about Steve Mackey, without doubt the most nervous in the group. However, I believe that we can actually channel that nervousness into something really good. You know, as far as I'm concerned, he got up there, he delivered, 
And it's very difficult for people to stand up in front of uh, strangers and do that. The two biggest fears people have are death and public speaking or comedy. And a lot of people put you know, comedy and public speaking ahead of death. Now, he got up there, he delivered. We got to work on his uh, self-doubt. We got to work on his concerns about being judged. But at the end of the day, everyone in that group was laughing. Meanwhile, back at Imperial Hotel, Glyn had an equally challenging task designed to test the group's willingness to commit to being in the spotlight, regardless of how foolish it might make them look. Now, I want you to imagine, if you will, that we are, when we're on the stage here, this is Carnegie Hall. And what I want you to do, I'm going to ask you to come up here and sing Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. And then I'm going to give you an affliction or a circumstance or an affectation that I want you to use while you're singing Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. It's all about singing the song with the affliction or the condition secondary. So if you're constipated and you're dying to go to the toilet, for example, you have to be acting as if you're dying to go to the toilet, but you sing the song nevertheless. I want you to do this as if you are the world's greatest opera singer. Twinkle, twinkle. You walk on the stage, someone has told you the funniest joke you've ever heard in your life. Uh, twinkle, twinkle, little star. <laughs> How I wonder what you are. I'm <laughs> above the world so high, like a diamond in the sky. Twinkle, twinkle, little star. How I wonder what you are. The microphone doesn't work. You almost have to sing so loud, it brings the house down. Twinkle, twinkle, little star. <laughs> what do you want? I want you to imagine that you've had a drug, it's called MDMA or ecstasy. Talia, you have Tourette's. Twinkle, fuck. <laughs> Can I start again? <laughs> fuck. Hello, oh, sorry, fuck. Uh, uh, fuck! Sorry. Uh, uh. Ooh. Shut up. <laughs> Twinkle, t fuck. <laughs> up above the world, so I'm fucking nailing it. Twinkle, little star. <laughs> You're very, very famous. Mm. Women just I love you. Hey. <laughs> Really no. Every time you say the word star, it reminds you of someone who you really have loved and they're no longer here. Twinkle, twinkle, little star. Um, uh, how, uh, how I wonder uh, what you are. Um, I want you to seduce the audience. How are you? You're an angry punk. Fuck you. <laughs> twinkle, twinkle, little star. How I wonder what you are. It was now time to meet today's guest comedian. Jack Levi, better known around the country as the deadpan character, Elliot Goblet. One time I went for a job interview, but it only lasted two minutes, because on that day I just wasn't in the mood to answer any questions. 
Jack's creation first appeared on the comedy scene in 1981, performing at comedy clubs in Melbourne and Sydney. Within a few months, he had established his unique comedy identity and was appearing regularly on television shows like Hey Hey It's Saturday and The Footy Show. After 40 years in the business, thousands of live performances all over the world, including the Montreal Comedy Festival, an ARIA-nominated album called Internally Berserk, and a collection of some of his best one-liners in the album Goblet's Greatest Bits, Elliot Goblet has become one of this country's most well-known and loved comedic talents. I have a total of three and a half alcohol-free days a week. I don't drink every day of the week for the first half of the day. <laughs> and uh, you know what? I'm going to leave these very fine people in your very capable hands. Thank you That's very it. much, Thank Levi. Thank you. Thank you, mate. Thanks, Good. And thanks for the introduction, Glyn. Uh, beautifully memorised. <laughs> My topic is character development and the handling of hecklers in character. Uh, I'm not an actor, and that was uh, revealed to me very early in my career when I did acting classes, and the teacher then told me, Jack, you're never going to make it as an actor because you can't show any facial expression. So that was a bit of a trigger, actually. I thought, well, maybe there's something in that. So I realised the only way I could be successful was to look at myself and expand or exaggerate my own characteristics. I'm obsessed with detail. That is a real characteristic of Jack Levi. So I made my character obsessed with trivia. Lines like, uh, do you ever wonder how unfair it is that only one hole in your watch band gets all the action? <laughs> or do you ever wonder why a trailer isn't twice as big as a semi-trailer? <laughs> so they're examples of an obsession with trivia, and I've got stacks of them in my act. Jack is a bit mischievous, so I made my character very mischievous. In lines like, a few weeks ago I helped this really old guy cross the road, I carried his walking stick for him. <laughs> or I like to go to a pizza shop and using their address order a home delivery pizza from another pizza <laughs> shop. <laughs> so lines like that really display extreme mischief. I'm a bit paranoid. Like all good Jewish people, I'm a bit paranoid and I've made my character very paranoid. I'm really paranoid that one day my shower rose is going to fall onto my head, so I've just installed an airbag inside my shower cap. <laughs> <laughs> that is extreme paranoia. As Elliot God, I look like a guy who's having a boring life. But talk about having an adventurous life and also with a bit of kinky sex thrown into that. Basically, the Elliot Goblet character is understated in manner and overstated in matter. Personally, I would love to see more comedians develop comedy characters. And if it's a great character, you will certainly become visible and break through the clutter. I went to a restaurant and there was a sign that said, we take all cards. So I gave them a sympathy card <laughs> with the words, sorry, I left my wallet at home. <laughs> Quashing hecklers is an important part of anyone's act. My heckler quashers have to be harmless, non-aggressive and understated. They just sound like insults without being insults. For example, if somebody heckled me in the old days, I used to say things like... <laughs> I think Speaking a painting has heckled me just then. <laughs> if someone had to go at my appearance, I'd say, look, mate, if I had a face like yours, we'd be twins. <laughs> and if I got angry, and you can get angry doing stand-up comedy, if somebody really agitates you, rather than lose my temper, I would say, look, mate, uh, please stop heckling me as I'm building into a punchline because I find it really hard to concentrate, and so does everyone else. And then I'll say, uh, sorry, mate, didn't mean to lose my temper then, just went off my head. <laughs> so that's getting the point across in character without getting aggressive and remaining understated. In terms of hecklers that are really bad, I, the, the heckles that hurt are people that yell out things like, uh, when are you going to start being funny? If somebody tells you to get off, that hurts too. It doesn't happen to me much, but it happened to me a lot in the early days, you know, when you're, a, when you're starting off, can be a, people can be a bit cruel. People and actually do that now? Have you seen um, over the years? Like, is it now? Because people are a little bit more. Very rare, but I copped it at Rudy Hill RSL. How does it affect you internally and in your focus? If they're up front, right under my nose, and they're going, oh, after I'm telling jokes that others are laughing at but they don't like, that's a bit aggravating. When comics go on TV shows, yeah. do you submit your script to them before you perform? Yes. I had to do that with everything, even my appearances on The Footy Show. They wanted 
to see script because I was in dialogue with Eddie Maguire. But yeah, they, they want to see it just in case there's something politically not right there or something crude. The group was spellbound by Jack's anecdotes and observations from his 40 years in the industry. Here was an opportunity to pick the brains of someone who had already paved the way. And for Talia, the notion of creating a character rather than presenting as herself had definite appeal. If I had to think about what you've said here about exaggerating who you really are, yeah. you know, I think about um, you know, being a woman, also Jewish, raised by a single mum, you know, without touching on stereotypes, which sometimes can be a low blow or cheapening yourself, because it might be easier to step into a performance, because sometimes I want to say something and I go, oh, that's not very me. OK, you know? what is there that stands out about you? Do you? Would you say that it's a bit different to the rest? It dresses know. quite plainly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was asked, you know, do you ever talk about your fashion. I so said, I've never looked at my fashion as being a character. That's me. I love colour. I, I don't know how much you can do about your clothes. Yeah, but, you I know. don't. that's for me not something that stands out. You yeah. know, obvi the obvious factors I think for me is being young, yep. um, being part of this generation that's, you know, I don't know, technology or whatever. I come from Sydney, so, you know, okay. housing crisis, everything's so expensive. And, yep. You know, obviously I'm a woman as well, which yeah, is very, very, yeah. 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 Well, <laughs> if it's within the umbrella of what the audience expect, you know. And you do things that are consistent with that, then the audience will laugh, you know. The content doesn't have to be so strong. Stimulating, thought-provoking discussion, clearly fueled by the notion that in just three days, these wannabe comedians would be standing in front of a live audience for the very first time. And to help them prepare, Jack had a very Elliot Goblet-esque idea of how they could practice dealing with hecklers. Hard knock knockers, follow me. All right. Yeah, follow me and watch the steps. There are no steps, but watch them anyway. In this room, just waiting for everybody to be inside and then we'll get things moving. Now, I want you to just walk around and absorb this glorious art. So just take a few moments to check out all the paintings in this room. Just some stunning artwork all in the one room. How lucky are we? We'll get you to sit down, some of you on chairs and some of you on the front seat so that I can have a chat to you about what we're here for. This is going to be an exercise in heckling. It's an unusual exercise. I'm not getting you to heckle me or heckle yourselves. I want to see you actually heckle the paintings and also respond on behalf of the paintings. In other words, we're getting heckling and we're getting heckler quashes. For example, this painting. A heckle for this painting would be, hey, where are the other apostles? There are quite a few correlations between performance art and visual arts because you're trying to communicate a message that you want the audience to receive and feel certain feelings and act in a certain way. So the only big difference is that when you're doing performance art, the audience is right in front of you and they're able to give you feedback directly. Whereas in visual art, most of the time it's hanging in a gallery and the artist isn't there to cop uh, any of the immediate feedback. So it's a little bit less daunting, I would say. And the response from the painting would be, uh... I've got this theory that there's a cannibal amongst us. If Elliot could speak on behalf of the art and if there's anything I would want the art to say back, it's, you know, just essentially step off. <laughs> you know, art is what it is and you can't really, uh, you can't really critique it because it, each to their own, yeah. How would you heckle that painting? Well, I think you've got a split personality there. You've got a split head. You've got a split head? <laughs> okay. Oh, OK, yeah, yeah, OK. <laughs> Not, not handling it very well. No, it's, it's weird, like, I, I can handle negative stuff. I'm fine with that. It's, uh, it sounds strange, but... Compliments... I'm not used to it. They say a black cat is a bad luck. So I hope that bee stinks at you, pussy. Ha, <laughs> alright. At least I've had some in the last week. <sighs> uh... I don't know if I am. I don't, I don't feel that I'm funny. I prefer a pink pussy. Maybe the response from the painting would be racist. You racist, or yeah, something like that, because it's yeah. black. They're all pink on the inside. They're all pink on the inside. Good on your mum. <laughs> 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 
I don't know. No, this is tough because you got to you got to put yourself out there, I know. And uh, I'm trying to deal with that, yeah. Uh, would you tell us some jokes, four eyes? Who do you think you are, Elliot Goblet? <laughs> do you mind opening yours when you say that? For me, the the whole you know me being a character is is very new. You know, I might look like an extrovert and sound like an extrovert, but we're all internalise a lot. So for me, a light bulb has gone in my head where I've gone, well, why don't I just put my newfound and old together and create something new? Will I then be able to step out of my comfort zone, take the next step, say a couple of things that I really want to say, maybe something amazing or horribly offensive or who knows, <laughs> that's the fun part, will come out. Okay, incidentally, Elliot Goblet uh, paints and he's got a style of his own which he describes as semi-abstract Renaissance period symbolism with features of neoclassical latter-day cubism. And his specialty is painting rubber thongs for You're about as boring as a painting of beach houses. At least I know how to put my makeup on. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Get out. <laughs> get out. Wow. A bit hard to come back when someone yeah. says get out. Is there a job in professional heckling? Because if I could do that, that would be amazing. I'll just get paid to go to other comedian shows and just yell out. Go back to Bollywood. Don't be so fucking racist. <laughs> I think if the art could defend itself from the heckling, I think it would say there is no wrong answer in art. It doesn't have to be everyone's cup of tea. So just because one person doesn't like the art doesn't mean that it's not exactly what someone else would love to see or hang up in their home. Sometimes the audience are enjoying your, your verbal fisticuffs more than they are enjoying your work. It can be very funny, particularly if you've got a, a really smart heckler that keeps coming back, and the audience want more of that. So you can go for a while, but then you've got to get back onto your act, because the longer you stay away from it, the harder it is to get back into your act. 30 seconds in interact and somebody heckles, I'll use something like, uh, uh, too early to heckle, please come back to me later. You call that a crack? Like your mum was smoking when she was pregnant with you. Oh! <laughs> You can really get the audience go against you when you use a, a mallet instead of a little tapper. You know, so it's really important to um, have the appropriate heckle for the interruption you get. So is that too big an art that I use? Probably yes, I'd say, yeah. Just reading between the lines, Brad, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's a learning process, for sure. Yeah, and like Elliot said, you, yeah, the, the heckler can become, it can add to the value of the performance. Hey, cock eyes. Cock eyes, hey? <laughs> At least you didn't mention the elephant in the room. <laughs> <laughs> that, how good is that? Yeah. Well okay. Now we're going to try something really different called speed heckling. You're a pussy. Oh, that's all right. <laughs> Show us your front bum. <laughs> you are so. You look like you've had a stroke. You doing all right? Are you heckling by numbers? So I've got a trunk call coming in. You should really branch out into another job. I did, but I leaked the last one. <laughs> you look a bit stoned, what's going on? I am a bit washed out and you're not helping. Next time on Is This Thing On? With just 48 hours before the performance, tension within the group your... starts to escalate. Yeah. Kim clashes with Stacey. Can I just finish what I'm saying? Thank Judy you. goes missing completely. She hasn't said anything to anyone. And Brad refuses to talk on camera. The show's behavioural analyst, Steve Van Apron, offers Kara a strategy to help her with self-esteem and resorts to hypnosis in order to help Steve Mackey cope with his crippling confidence one, issue. One, two, three, sleep now, drifting down, relaxing deeper and deeper. And guest comedian Chris Franklin teaches stage technique and introduces the students to the toughest audience they will ever face. Uh. <laughs> I just want to be left alone. <laughs> just leave me alone. Uh.